resume the third session of and last session of our paper presentation the chair of the session will be hem raj bensal assistant professor of english central university of himachal pradesh so the list of paper presenters in this session are ms mohana priya m ms noble a palia n rama gomadi mr nahid hasan sagriga kotoki Uh, thank you thank you so much uh, ashisha and uh, savior uh, i'm sorry if i uh, pronounce your name uh, wrongly so uh, well in the very first place let me thank this cape comoran trust for providing me this opportunity to chair this session here and uh, the conference which is being organized on aquatic literature uh, it is actually uh, receiving a lot of attention and then yes the subject happens to be quite unique and the papers uh, presented earlier and then presented offline right so uh, the discussion about sea literature and then sea narratives it was what was the focus in all of them and in the and in this session too we are going to have six presenters uh, and then uh, all those six presenters they will be uh, presenting i mean on different aspects of this uh, that is sea literature and uh, one or two from a uh, feminist uh, perspective too so uh, well uh, not taking much time since we have got only one hour let me uh, tell all the presenters here that uh, try to conclude your discussion within 7 uh, minutes your paper within 7 minutes and then 2 uh, 3 minutes will be given for uh, question answers right so 7 minutes it is the deadline for you kindly okay. adhere to that Uh, and then so that so that we could do some justice with discussion part 2 so well uh, not uh, taking much time i go to the first presenter here first uh, presenter is uh, miss uh, mohan priya m assistant professor department of english shri shankar lal sundarbai shashank jain college for women chennai uh, miss mohan priya m is going to speak on water in human body humor in shakespeare's characterization So over to you, Miss Mohan Priya M. Thank you, sir. Am I audible? Yes, you are audible. Uh, sir, can I present my screen? I have certain slides. May I? Uh, you can. You 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 can uh, present. Uh, keep note of. Keep track of time too. Sure, sure, sir, sir. Sure. Thank you, sir. Yes, please go ahead. Yes, sir. Is my screen visible? yeah it is visible yes yes so good evening everyone i am mohana priya from uh, sri shankar lal sundarbai shasun jain college for women and my topic is water in human body humor in shakespeare's characterization uh, if you all know the conference theme is uh, aquatic literature and uh, uh, we look at uh, different forms of water like rivers seas lakes and glaciers i wanted to look at water that's present uh, inside the human body in various forms so in that sense uh, all of us know that uh, uh, we have amniotic fluid inside our body we have cellular fluid uh, enzymes the, even enzymes contain uh, water and there are also other uh, fluids like blood uh, inside our body and uh, when i was thinking about uh, how to look at Uh, water within the human body i came across this uh, humoral theory and this was developed in the ancient greece and rome uh, this theory this uh, so called humoral theory theory is based on four bodily fluids and uh, these fluids are blood black bile yellow bile and phlegm it was first proposed by hippocrates and uh, he associated the natural elements like the earth the air the water and the fire with uh, the bodily fluids so earth is associated with black bile air it was associated with bl blood water was associated with phlegm a uh, phlegm and fire was associated with the yellow bile which is also called the choler later galen came and he started associating apart from uh, the associated natural elements he started associating a lot of personality traits with these bo uh, four humors or the bodily fluids now according to galen uh, if somebody who's got excess of blood 
the person is called sanguine and these are the traits of that particular personality being uh, social being friendly being happy being youthful so these are some of the traits related with blood and these traits being false being easily angered being passionate being intense about something being brave and all these characters are related to hello bye and uh, the characters such as Liz, uh, being passive, being, being very calm, uh, being fragile, being weak, all these traits are related to phlegm. And uh, being very sad, uh, loving uh, solitude, uh, somebody who prefers darkness, all these uh, traits are related to somebody who has excess black bile in the body. Now, coming to the theory, uh, the theory says that there should be a balance among these four fluids inside the human body. If there's too much of imbalance, uh, the theory uh, uh, believe or uh, uh, Galen and Hippocrates believe that if there is too much of imbalance in these humoral fluids inside the body, it might result in sickness in that individual. And if there is slight imbalance, for example, if a particular person has too much uh, black bile then the characteristics related to black bile which is melancholic being melancholic being being uh, a lover of solitude being uh, introspective all th that particular person who's got ex excessive black bile would uh, have these personality traits that is what the theory is all about and uh, this theory held good till the renaissance period after which with the advent of modern science with the advent of modern medicine slowly people started disproving this theory but we have a lot of uh, uh, traces in the elizabethan literature and when we talk about elizabethan literature i wanted to show uh, the textual references wherein we can see references to these humoral uh, theory when it comes to shakespearean plays so i've taken up two plays namely hamlet and macbeth now coming to hamlet uh, the character Hamlet in the play, the character Hamlet, he portrays two dominant personalities. On one side, people claim him to be melancholic, whether it is his own uh, mother, the Gertrude, or his uncle father, Claudius, or his own friends, Rosencrantz, Guildenstern. Uh, they project or they portray a Hamlet to be melancholic. And we also know the reason for him being melancholic because he has lost his father and his mother has uh, married his own uncle. So we also know the reason for his melan of, of his uh, melancholic nature. But the point here is there are there are textual references wherein Hamlet wishes to be a sanguine person. Now sanguine is related to blood. Yeah, sanguine is related to blood and he he wishes to be a very friendly person but he's not able to do do that because he is most of the time dry, dry, drenched in his melancholy now uh, when i read through hamlet again recently uh, keeping in mind the humoral theory i found or i guessed maybe uh, the reason for his madness might be this tug of war tug of war wherein he wanted to remain uh, so a sanguine person sometimes he wanted to become a choleric person also because he wanted to be argumentative in, in front of uh, claudius but he is not able to do so so this conflict uh, uh, between what he wants to be and what he does not want to be maybe that would have also resulted in his madness and uh, uh, i forgot to tell this point uh, these are the organs the the humoral theory also shows us that these organs are the storage organs for these bodily fluids for example blood is stored in the liver yellow bile is stored in the gallbladder phlegm is stored in the lungs and black bile is stored stored in the spleen we also have textual references wherein all these bodily organs are also mentioned in the plays of shakespeare yeah this is the introductory scene and uh, this is where his mother gertrude questions hamlet she says good hamlet cast the united color of do not seek for thy noble father in the dust. So she's trying to tell him, come on, don't be so melancholy. Come out of your melancholy because uh, if uh, anybody who is born will have to die. So I understand your uh, your love for your father. I understand everything. But see to it, you come out of your melancholy. So she is also trying to portray um, Hamlet as a melancholy character. And, um, and we see a lot of, uh, I told you, um, Hippocrates, uh, attached a lot of natural, uh, attached each natural element with each fluid, each bodily fluid. So in that sense, melancholy or the yellow bile was related to earth. And we see uh, Shakespeare mentioning the word earth or its va variants, for example, earthly or muddy 23 times in the text. And uh, Hamlet wants to show or wants to be, wishes to be a sanguine person. And in a lot of his dialogues, this uh, uh, word air is mentioned or blood is mentioned. And these words show that he wishes to be a 
which is to remain as a sanguine person. And this, this, this is again by Hamlet to Horatio. And blessed are those whose blood and judgment are so well commingled. So he wanted to be somebody uh, who's sanguine, who's got wisdom, but he's not able to do that again because of his melancholy. Moving on. And he portrays uh, Claudius as a person who's dipped in collar, which means somebody who's very argumentative, who's very aggressive. Yes, this is uh, how Claudius is portraying Hamlet. There's something in his soul over which his melancholy sits on brood, and and I do doubt the hatch and the disclose will be some danger, which for to prevent I have in quick determination. And the dialogue continues. So Claudius also believes that he is into his melancholy. He is feeling sad, uh, and that is why he is becoming mad. And this is by Hamlet, my wits deceased. Hamlet also agrees that he is not in a balanced uh, uh, state. His uh, mental condition is unstable and he is not able to take decision. He is not able to act immediately. He keeps procrastinating things and he is also aware of that because he also believes that uh, something within him is disturbing him. And towards the end only, we find these lines from uh, Hamlet. This is at Ophelia's burial, where, wherein he says, I'm not splenative and rash. Again, spleen is the body organ which stores uh, uh, black bile. And Hamlet asserts to the end of the play that he is not he or he doesn't want to be a melancholic person and the yellow bile is stored and yellow bile refers to a person a choleric person who can take decisions immediately who can execute actions immediately who can be aggressive so he repents that he is not able to or he does not have that particular organ to contain uh, yellow bile so he's not able to be be aggressive and pigeon liver is a very small liver of course he's got that sanguine nature but sanguine nature is being uh, uh dominated by his melancholy so this that is why anderson the critic has pointed out saying hamlet is feeling sad or he's he's asking himself why he's got only slight characteristics of being sanguine and why is he not able to be a choleric person therefore looking at uh, hamlet using the lens of humor yes sir i'm sorry i'm sorry you need to conclude now yeah uh, yeah i'm con concluding sir so looking at looking at hamlet through the lens of humoral theory of course we 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 see a lot of textual references relating to uh, mentioning words such as blood earth air and <clears throat> We also see his conflict wherein he wants to be sanguine and choleric on the one on the one hand, and he does not want to be melancholic on the other hand, whereas he remains as melancholic throughout the play. Only towards the end, he is able to partly come out of his melancholic nature. So this is with Hamlet, and it moves on with uh, it goes to Macbeth and uh, Henry Part Four also. Uh, due to time constraints, I'll conclude here. Okay, okay. Thank you so much. Uh, well, thank you, Mohan uh, Actually, you explored very well this uh, theory of humors, uh, how it ac actually uh, took its journey from Greek times and then to Elizabethan age, right, during the Renaissance period, and then how later on we find Ben Johnson coming on the scene and then using this theory of humors in, in a great deal, right? Now, uh, I was interested actually in when you were saying water in human body. Okay, fine, you were looking at water from that perspective of biles actually yellow bile black bile etc uh, otherwise i was looking at other things too for example the way uh, some of shakespeare's plays like tempest for example it has been set actually uh, most of which is uh, set on a, a sea has been set on a sea anyway uh, well i really uh, liked your presentation uh, but then it is the same play it, you talked about hamlet which has also been uh, termed as an uh, as a as a great artistic failure, right? Yeah. Because of that indecisive nature of Hamlet, right? Because he's not able to take that decision. And it is for this reason that you would find that, that uh, see, what he goes on thinking is that, well, if I kill my uncle right now, when he's sitting in a worship, he will go directly to heaven. So he's, he's inactive there. My question from you is, what according to this theory of humors is responsible for that indecisive nature of hamlet in the in the play right what do you think that he why he is so indecisive that he is not able to act 
right? He goes on thinking, but he does not act ever. Would you like to comment on this? Yeah, yes, sir. Uh, I think that that uh, nature of being melancholic is actually leading him to be indecisive because melancholy comes along with insanity. And uh, if somebody is not sane, then whatever decision we take, I don't think we will be in a position to execute it immediately. We will start to uh, rethink. We will start. We will. We will stop for a while. We will again. Uh, 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 think, ponder whether it is right or wrong. So I think that melancholic, uh, the the humoral melancholic trait comes along with insanity, and that insanity is the reason for his indecisiveness. Uh okay, my my second question, which you would which I would like you to uh, actually respond briefly. Uh, why did you choose tragedies here? Why not comedies? Because uh, you would find that the element of comedies is in abundance in. Uh, I mean, element of humor is in abundance in comedies rather than in tragedies. I don't. I'm not. I'm not denying it is not there in tragedies. It is there, of course, right? Because it it gives you that comic relief, right? In a tragedy. But your choice. I'm just yeah. Talking even about in uh, yes, even in Merchant of Venice, when I was reading through Shakespearean plays again for this purpose, I also went through Merchant of Venice, and I was able to relate Shylock again uh, with. Uh, the caller personality. He's being argumentative. He's being pa passive. He, uh, not passive. He's being passionate. He's being intense in whatever he does. So he also is being portrayed with all these choleric traits. Of course, we can apply uh, the humoral theory to comedy. But I wanted to talk about uh, uh, Hamlet in particular because the play is my personal favorite. So when I was start, when I looked at Hamlet, I was able to look at Claudius and Hamlet especially. Um, so we had a lot of textual references referring to the character of Hamlet, and so I uh, I was sticking on to Hamlet's character. Okay, Mohan Priya, you wonderfully answered, and thank you so much. I hope uh, audience enjoyed uh, listening to your paper. Uh, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, well, I I proceed to the next presenter now. The next presenter with us is uh, Miss uh, Noble A. Palik. Right, assistant professor, Department of English, Sacred Heart College, uh, in in uh, Kerala, and uh, the title here is uh, William John Banville's The Sea as an Aushi narrative. So over to you. Dear all, good afternoon. Am I audible to you? Uh, you are audible, ma'am, but not visible. You are partially visible. If you tilt, yeah, yeah, it is Am fine. I now. Visible right now. Uh, again, I would say you tilt a bit more. Okay. Yes, yes. Okay. yes, 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 yes. Now it's perfect. Please, please go ahead and then keep, uh, keep, keep uh, this a uh, track of time. You have got seven minutes. Okay. Okay. Uh, dear all, good evening. I'm Miss Noble Apaliet, Assistant Professor. Department of English, Sacred Heart College for Women, Chalakudi, Thrissur, Kerala, India. I'm here to present a paper entitled William John Banville's The Sea, 2005, as an Ocean Narrative. William John Banville, in anonymity, Benjamin Black, is a writer to whom a series of descriptive labels can be attached. He is known to the literary world as a novelist, a short story writer, a screenwriter, and so on. Of all his literary outpourings, as far as my paper presentation is concerned, what deserves a special mention here is the 2005 Man Booker Prize winning novel, The Sea. It tells the story of a widowed art historian, Max Moden, who revisits his native town, child, his childhood destination on the sea. This is in fact a, a first person narrative. The story of course uh, is set in part in an Irish seaside village um, and the protagonist Max Moden is aged 60 and he is presented as being thoroughly disillusioned, uh, completely devastated, emotionally overwhelmed, uh, and utterly frustrated by his uh, wife's death 
due to cancer. When the novel begins, uh, we find uh, Max uh, standing, looking at the sea. And when the novel ends, we also find him standing, looking at the sea. The sea in the novel is a laden um, with imagery, both a symbolic and a literary significance. The sea is depicted in the novel as an ironical object that has the power of both healing and hurting. In the novel, we find that the protagonist Max Morden travels to the sea three times in his entire life. The first time in his childhood, the second time during the illness of his deceased wife, and for the third time after the death of his wife, Anna, and this final visit to the sea is with his daughter, Claire. We can see in the due course of the novel that the sea becomes um, a symbol of womb warmth for Max. The novel abounds uh, in sea imagery. Having positioned himself uh, in the littoral zone, Max Morden looks forward to the sea as a means of escape uh, from the troubling realities of his life, uh, from his current uh, life uh, situation. Uh, being near the sea, he gets the chance to document uh, the tides of grief currently experienced by him. Sometimes the grief uh, hits uh, and rolls. Uh, sometimes uh, it is uh, calm and quiet. The crests and troughs in his life uh, are all, in essence, uh, typically suggestive of the volatile, unpredictable, and indifferent nature of the sea. There is also yet another evidence in the novel. He labels himself and his daughter as vessels of woe. He employs uh, the metaphor of a ship and seafaring in the dark autumnal night. Max Morden successfully conveys the very essence of his suffering spirit as he floats in the sea of grief and memory. According to him, when someone dies, uh, we carry his or her memories with us until we too die and our memories are carried over by others and this process goes on. It's limitless, endless, timeless, ceaseless as the sea, the sea of memories. Transporting us forward towards infinity. C is in fact personified in the novel, treating it as if it were a person. Max Morden also ponders over the existential angst of an individual. A brooding melancholy characterizes his whole thought process as he questions the very purpose and meaning of life. He fails terribly to decode the mysteries of life uh, just as uh, we are ignorant and unaware of the mysteries that lurk beneath the vast expanse of the sea. As I mentioned earlier, the novel is set by the sea. It is a typically a sea fiction. To conclude, the novel is in fact a shining testimony as to how the ocean, the sea, remains a vital presence in literature for both the characters and the readers. The sea becomes a symbol of the winds of change, the life of characters, as they yearn for another life and attempt to escape from their current life situation. The sea lies out there, vast and open. The novel ends with the narrator standing, looking out to the sea, and the readers are free to make their own constructive suggestions, possible explorations, and extended readings. Let me quote uh, a striking, uh, I'm sorry, let me quote a few striking sentences uh, that one finds uh, towards the end of the novel. He exclaims, well, 
it is no matter. There are other things I can do. I can go to Paris and paint, or I might retire to a monastery, pass my days in quiet contemplation of the infinite, or write a great treatise there. Or yes, life is pregnant with possibilities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Miss Noble Palit. You uh, talked about a novel which is about love, which is about loss, and which is about uh, this this you know unpredictable power of memory. Uh, you talked about narrator Max Modan, right? Uh, who is a middle-aged Irish man and who actually, uh, after losing his uh, wife or who after his wife's death, right, goes back to the seaside town where he had spent his uh, summer holidays as a child. And then uh, it is something for him, which is a retreat from the grief and from the anger, uh, right? And at the same time, the, the emptiness that he feels around him without his, uh, that is, uh, life partner. Uh, now, as far as I could understand your, uh, that is, uh, this, this uh, paper, uh, the see as such, it does uh, appear as a, a companion when it comes to looking at him, looking at the sea, I, I mean, in the form of personification that you made here, right? Now, uh, how far you actually agree with this? right that the sea in this novel it acts as a redeemer it acts as a reliever or it acts as a you know a healer to the narrator who loses interest in life after his wife's death uh, this this question from you i mean see as healer would you like to comment on it I hope you. I hope you got my got my uh, question here. Yes, yes, Miss Palit. Would you like to respond to what I just uh, said, or you are not able to listen to me? Uh, so, ma'am is on mute. I guess, ma'am, you are on mute. Yes. yes, sir. Could you please repeat the question? I was only to hear whether C uh, can be interpreted as a redeemer in the novel. Yeah, so redeemer right? can, uh, or healer for that matter. Right. Because after all, it is a sort of cathartic experience. Okay. Uh, see, I, I hope I have already uh, made a comment with yeah, regard to the function uh, role. I'm sorry, function played by the C in the novel. Um, in the due course of my presentation, I did uh, uh, articulate a point this way. In this novel, the sea is uh, treated as a symbol and is seen as uh, a womb warmed uh, by Max Moore. So I hope I can definitely agree with your statement. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you so much. And then, yes, uh, it is in the same novel that he says that, oh, the past beats inside me like a second heart. So he actually wants to overcome, right, what happened with him in the in the form of his wife's that is uh, death, and then eventually how he tries to cope with that, right? So thank you, thank you so much, uh, uh, ma'am, uh, for your presentation because here we are looking at C as a companion, as a friend in times of adversity. Now uh, let us uh, thank you so much. Uh, let you, us go sir. to the let us go to the third presenter. Uh, third presenter is uh, N. Uh, Rama Gomathe, Sir Scholar Department of English, St. John's College. Uh, and then uh, the title of the paper is Fall of Civilization in Quest of Water, Ecological Aspect in J.G. Uh, Ballard's The Drought. Over to you, N. Rama Gomathe. So, uh, good evening, everyone. I'm I'm Ramad Gomati, research scholar from St. George's College, Sinai Valley. Uh, the topic I'm going to present is Fall of Civilization in Quest of Water, Ecological Aspect in J.G. Ballard's The Drop. Uh, James Graham Ballard, 
uh, is one of the, was one of the most influential English author of the late 20th century. And he was born in Shokoi, and he spent most of his period, his childhood period in Japanese imprisonment camp uh, during the Japanese-China War. And this tragic period has had a profound impact on his life and future writing career. And uh, J.J. Ballard's The Draw is the third work in his trilogy. The others include The Wind from Nowhere and The Drought World of Climate Fiction. Uh, and these novels were published in early 1960s as the primary examples of climate fiction that draw this novel stands out in the series as a novel in which the catastrophe is fully caused by human actors and draw being the third novel of this climate fiction uh, that envisions a future society which is ruined by the evils of the capitalist world order and this novel records Ballard's vision of a world running out of water. And in one of the uh, interview uh, regarding his novel, Drawn, Ballard has said that uh, this novel, The Drawn, represents a future dominated by sand and which becomes the end of the world. As the title depicts, uh, it implies that a world threatened by uh, drastic climate changes caused by heavy industrial activities and heavy uh, that were caused by humans and the chemicals and other industrial waste dumped into rivers and seas all around the world that has led to the obstruction of evaporation and rainfall and led by a sort of plastic layer covered on the oceans. And this constant exposure to sun and no precipitation cycle make human beings suffer lack of rain, food, and drinking water. The novel reveals how civilization, civilization falls apart in quest for even a little water, portraying the return of scientifically and technologically advanced modern sciences to their primitive conditions. And this novel it is divided into three parts. The first part, it describes both the protagonist, Dr. Charles Ransom's background, this relationship with the supporting characters and also how the town people leaving the town dodge now for the coast in search of water. The second part of the novel covers the period of 10 years after the environmental apocalypse during the intervening decade of which the majority of refugees die off while the survivors seek to get drinking water from seawater of what is left by refining it in old and rickety machines. And the third part, it deals with ransoms and other surviving characters returned to the town Dashma in the hope uh, that some water still remain back in the town. And this novel, The Drought, it instantly begins in an apocalyptic setting. The author de delineates how a uh, landscape changes over time and how the changes influence the human psyche. Uh, Ballard had tried to show that human beings are affected by the changing world so much as they transform the planet into a devastated land. The more the river the dries up, the more it destroys the communities of fishermen whose lives are maintained by its flow. And thus every individual fall apart from the society and get lost in time. The sun beats down on the burning air. It evaporates the spirit of man. The protagonist feels that everything is down to drink. Memories and sentiments are washed away. And needless to say, money is replaced by water in this apocalyptic world. To say differently, uh, the lack of water transforms humankind into something evil. And Banner invents that uh, this destruction of the natural world corrupts the human spirit more and more. Uh, which can be uh, cited by the fight uh, in, in the in incident with the novel, which can be cited between the fight uh, between the fisherman and the churchman, when the former, that is the fisherman group, burned churches, and the later uh, churchman uh, group set fire to some of the houses in the town. So people who do not recognize the connection between the self and the nature burn the town that is already passing due to the drought. Uh, when the fighting groups uh, burn the town, uh, ransom and other reminding people cannot help them, but they try to escape to the coast. 
Ryanson says on the coast uh, that water, which has been exploited completely carelessly until the brought, is now being preserved by the military force. And uh, the military people actually they have been preserving it and they do not allow everyone. So, uh, as who try to pass the fences, double wire fences, without the permission, without the knowledge of the military people, they shot down to death. And although the survivors are closer to water, though a little on the coast, they still feel distressed and hopeless because time, together with the drought, has eroded all their past and future. And they feel that they are buried in the salt dunes. Uh, the concept of time becomes meaningless on the coast. Uh, this time, because people are disconnected from their past, uh, their memories have faded away for the sake of survival, and the world is stripped away of the meaning. Uh, believing that uh, there must be some water back in the Lashman town. Uh, ransom goes back there since there is no hope in the salt dunes on the coast. Uh, ransom, uh, the character protagonist Ransom, accompanied by other characters, uh, they take a line as their guide because on their way they uh, see a line and they take it as their guide because uh, Ransom is concerned, uh, convinced that uh, there is some another water source near the coast because without the water source, a line could not be survived. So this incident uh, has some mythological reference. That is, this incident uh, reminds the reader of the flood in Genesis. So when the dough which Noah sends to find out the situation of the world, <coughs> sorry, returns to him with a fresh olive leaf in its beak. So Noah sees that the water has subsided from the earth. So this is one mythological reference here. In a similar way, the line could be the sign of a possible end of the dog. Your, your time is uh, running out now, so you need to conclude. Uh, because I am going to conclude it, sir. Uh, this event shows that mankind still gets uh, help from the natural elements. And the novel ends with Ransom's constant hope for flowing river in the large world. Uh, tired out in his, in his quest for water, Ransom uh, merges his outer journey with his inner journey. Ransom's completion of his inner journey refers to a concept of self-realization. Uh, Self-realization real, uh, refers to realization of humanity's inherent qualities and to the formation of uh, internal connections to other parts of the universe, thereby providing ecological consciousness. Ransom is now a self-realized human being since he identifies his ego with nature, enlarging the boundaries of his self beyond the skin. To conclude the fictional dystopian uh, function as cautionary tales that warn people about their political, social, cultural, religious, and industrial senses in their relationship with the natural world, the novel uh, discloses that environmental catastrophe does not happen overnight, which makes it take a while to reach its apocalyptic level. Uh, it is true that humanity is inseparable from nature, and this is completely and uh, properly understood. Uh, human beings will realize that um, doing harm to nature means hunting or hurting an integral part of them and thus will give up injuring nature uncontrollably. Uh, thank you, sir. Okay, okay. Th thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Ramaji. Now, well, uh, you talked about uh, J.G. Ballard's uh, this uh, uh, novel. Now, J.G. Ballard, he didn't uh, exactly predict California's current drought, right? We know that it is it happened in uh, California recently. Now, he didn't predict it, as I'm saying, uh, in his 1964 novel, for example, uh, the, the Burning World, for that matter, which later was renamed as the drought, right? But like so many of his books, right, it does obviously carry those, those uh, hints about a uh, humanity's accelerating race to you know stay ahead of nature right uh, just a small uh, a query from you if you would like to respond right do you think this uh, science fiction novel uh, serves as a cautionary tale for the humanity to harness natural resources judiciously so that we do not face this terrible dystopian future as projected in this novel As a, uh, so as, uh, J.J. Barrett, he has written as a, 
sorry sir there is some uh, technical issue i could not hear you properly there is a breakdown at the end of the question uh, can you please mm -hmm. repeat the question i am saying do you look at look at this novel as a cautionary tale Yes, Something. of course. I look at it as a cautionary tale while reading it because now we are facing water problem, right? So we get an awareness that we have to preserve water. So these fictional catastrophes serves as a cautionary tale, sir. I accept it. Okay, thank you, thank you, uh, uh, thank you, thank you, dear uh, Ramaji. Well, your paper was uh, well presented. Uh, now I you, uh, move to the move to the next presenter here. Uh, please take uh, note of time because we have three three more presentations. So uh, the next presenter is Nahid Hassan, a pro assistant professor, GGU Central University Department of Political Science, uh, Bilaspur, Chhattisgarh. And the topic uh, seems to be very interesting because it is uh, something which is uh, realistic. Uh, it is the business of water and suffering of the masses, looking at it through the Coca-Cola company in Kaladera, Rajasthan. So over to Nahid Hassan. Sir, please uh, conclude within six to seven minutes so that we could give space to or time to others too. Thank you. So thank you, sir. Good evening to everyone. I'm sorry, I, I mistook actually for a for a for a, a mail, Nahid Hassan. Okay, ma'am, please continue. Okay. The Coca-Cola Company is a multinational company based in America. It is founded in 1892 and it is the largest selling beverage company in the world based in United States of America. It is largely known for producing Coca-Cola. It sells non-alcoholic beverage across the globe. It offers 500 brands and 3,500 3, beverages in nearly 200 countries. The brand Coca-Cola includes so many brands across the globe like Costa Coffee, Fanta, the Sunny Waters, Nectars, and it continuously introduces new beverages to meet the taste of the masses. The business of Coca-Cola company depends on the access to of huge amounts of water reserves. So wherever its plant establishes, it dehydrates the region in order to feed its own plants. It dries down the water level, makes farmers well dry. It destroys farmers' land, their agriculture, and makes life of the indigenous difficult. The Coca company himself admits that its business could not survive without accessing huge amount of water. One liter of Coca Coca-Cola needs three liters of water for the for its <clears throat> for the survival of its business. The company needs huge water reserve to satisfy his need. Government of India explored the possibility of investment in the region. Subsequently, she invited corporate and MNCs to invest here. State governments invited MNCs in lieu of the business investment. She invited MNC in view of making the entire region a modern industrial hub. State government wanted to transform the region from a backward agricultural state to a modern industrial hub. Coca-Cola India Bottling Unit accepted the invitation with the <coughs> With a long-term planning and business potential, the Coca-Cola company made an alignment with the state government and set up their plant in Kaladera, Rajasthan. The company got continuous benefit from its plant here as its stock price and average revenue increased in the next decade. Coca-Cola company establishes its plant in Kaladera in, in Jaipur district of Rajasthan in 1999. Kaladera is a small village in Rajasthan. Rajasthan is already a desert state and Kaladera is known for its semi-arid conditions which receives less rainfall. Here farmers rely on the access of groundwater. With the advent of Coca-Cola plant, their, <clears throat> their sources of life and livelihood had gone under serious threat after the coca company Villagers and farmers faced serious decline of groundwater. It eventually led towards their loss of li livelihood as the farmer faced threatening to cultivate their land and sustain their livelihood in the, in the scarcity of groundwater which they faced. Coca-Cola plant consumed most of the water in the region. Kaladera has officially declared and overexploited by the Central Groundwater Board in 1998. 
groundwater level there dropped from 9 to 39 meters below in the 20 years from 1994 to 2004. Even in the peak season of summer, that is from April to June, which is the acute water stress period in the region, Terry estimated that Coca-Cola plant is responsible for 2.7% of the total water extraction. In May 2004, Coca-Cola plant was accounted for near about 8% of the total water extraction at the region. Since the Coca-Cola company came in Caladera, there was a significant, significant decline of groundwater. The decline led towards the loss of agriculture to the farmers of the region. They lost their livelihood due to the increased cost of irrigation. Their labor and cost both increased as they had to dig deeper to the ground in search of water. They need to purchase more powerful pump to bore water. It increased their cost of irrigation. This led towards the large amount of fallow lands following the scarcity of water. Women of the region claimed they were facing shortage of water for drinking and household purposes. It increased their labor to fetch water. Women also suffered from the less yielding of milk. This was because they could not provide enough water to, the, to their cattle. Due to these reasons, Coca-Cola plant at Caladera started facing protest from the local community there. They ac accused them for depleting the water resource and destroying their livelihoods. They only want the Coca-Cola plant to be closed there. They, in they intensified their movement from February 2003. They made their Sanghar Samiti for raising their demand in, the, in this context. Coca-Cola India responded with their argument that they are not doing any harm to the groundwater resources of the region. Company claimed that the allegations were made on the perception rather than any empirical facts. They claimed that they are in fact working for the water conservation. Vice President of the Coca-Cola India said, villagers do not understand our motivation to work with them on water conservation and objective for the need for collaborative work. Companies started taking certain focused measures for water preservation, like engaging the community to overcome the challenges of water scarcity, started promoting dip irrigation, offered 90% subsidy to the farmers for that. But as McDonald Christine says, these claims made by the Coca-Cola company did not match with the evidence at his investigation shows. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, Nahid uh, Hassanji. Well, uh, you talked about a very uh, pertinent issue and then uh, how this soft uh, drink giant Coca-Cola actually ventured into uh, uh, India, in Rajasthan particularly, and at a place called Kaladera. And then, yes, you did talk about uh, what effects actually uh, it has on the native, uh, that is, uh, water resources, or how it has led to, uh, that is, that difficulty in irrigating the, uh, that is, that is, uh, fields and so on and so forth. Right now, there is one term which is used uh, uh, in 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 it called uh, CSR, me meaning thereby corporate social responsibility. Yes. So this corporate social responsibility is actually which is the which is, which has to be kept in mind by those who actually think of installing any any plants for that matter, right? Or or anything uh, like Coca Cola. So how I mean what were the, what were the claims of uh, this social responsibility or corporate social responsibility of Coca Cola here? uh they, they in fact there is no responsibility they have just they have just only business in their mind they are just doing business increasing their are increasing their profit in the name of the responsibility that uh, educating the people to use their water plant how to take less water for irrigation but th these facts don't match with the evidence they're just yeah, doing because... their business and ultimately led the closer closer of the plant at caladera after 15 or after almost 15 years okay now now it has been closed that is what yes. i want to say yes okay okay so it was, it was the struggle of those people actually which led to this uh one thing that we could find is uh that uh, see there were people who were saying that well earlier uh, uh water could be raised at just 20 feet right but then 
the water cannot even be reached uh, you know even if you go 500 feet below the below the ground so that was something which has been caused by this a uh, coca cola company right yes. and this there there this uh, a bottling plant there so yes. i do hope that uh, people might have known through your paper as to as to uh, what effects it does have or such such uh, a plants for example have on the on the local uh, flora and fauna local population their agriculture and how it leads to the loss of livelihoods so yes. thank you Ali Hassan. i do hope that uh, the audience enjoyed your paper uh, me too enjoyed your paper so thank you so much now uh, I move to the next uh, presenter. Uh, next presenter is uh, uh, Sagarika Kotoki, Assistant Professor, Department of English, Assam Don Bosco University, uh, Sonapur, Assam. So the title here is uh, Matrimony, Marriage and Marital Rape, a reading through Shashi Deshpande's The Intrusion. So over to you, Sagarika Kotoki. Please uh, try to sum up your findings in five to uh, six minutes. I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm, I'm because you people make, uh, I mean, a lot many efforts. You work hard to prepare a paper, but then yes, this is a uh, time and again that we come across these time constraints. So Sagarika ji, kindly yes. try to try to accommodate. Over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, good evening, everyone. So uh, my name is Sagarika and I'm actually presenting a paper uh, that is uh, titled Equaphobia and an Immigrant Author, a reading show Rohington Mysteries Swimming Lessons. So there is a small technical glitch actually. Yeah, the title. No, actually, sir, that was, uh, you know, my mistake, you know, like I participated in two conferences and uh, somehow. Okay, uh, can you read it quickly? Your title now, Rohington Mysteries. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to uh, present uh, my screen, sir. If you okay. permit. Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, five to six minutes. Yes, yes. Sir, can you see my screen? I mean, like, is my slide visible? It is. It is. It is. Uh, yes, it is now. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. So the title of the paper is Equaphobia and an Immigrant Author, a reading through Rohington Mysteries, Swimming Lessons. So uh, this is a brief overview of my presentation. And then I will uh, directly introduce the author. Uh, Rohington Mystery uh, was born in Bombay in 1952, and he moved uh, to Toronto in 1975. And then uh, from uh, his collection of short stories, I had chosen uh, a short story called Swimming Lessons. This is the final story in his collection, Tales from Firoz Shah Bagh. And in this story, actually, Rohington Mystery tries to come uh, to terms with a different culture, a different life as an immigrant. And uh, the topic that I have chosen, uh, if we see the traditional or conventional reading of most of Rohington Mysteries works in general and swimming lessons in particular, uh, it actually uh, it is read as a story about uh, the idea of you know, the experiences of diasporic writers. And this is uh, a kind of a part of that, you know, the canon on diasporic uh, literature. But uh, I, I have also come uh, across when I, uh, you know, I try to understand the story. In the entire story, he actually uses water or imageries related to water, uh, you know, as markers to differentiate his experiences both in India as well as in Canada. So this paper is an attempt to study the water imageries in the text uh, with an understanding of his. Uh, quote unquote, this location and identity. So these are the objectives of the study. And I'm basically focusing on uh, the study of you know uh, what uh, how he is trying to uh, talk about the imageries or maybe the her concern his concern about ecology and environment. And uh, this study is primarily based on the close textual analysis. And uh, now the paper has three parts, so I will be little, you know, I'm just rushing in. And uh, first, we are talking, uh, looking into the idea of equaphobia or the narrator's uh, uh, for, you know, water. And then second part, I'm, you know, trying to understand how he's concerned about water in terms of its uh, ecological uh, kind of or environmental kind of, you know, issues. And finally, the imageries. So uh, trying to understand, you know, his fear 
uh, if we read the story, uh, we see that you know the story focuses on many elements that are often seen in the life of a new immigrant through a use of parallel stories. So imagery and effective diction. Firstly, the story is interesting in the way it flashes back and forth in the protagonist's mind. Uh, and Rohindran mystery effectively shows the difficulty an immigrant faces when uh, making a transition into another urban environment. However, uh, the narrator, we find, you know, uh, there is a detailed narrative on his swimming lessons and uh, the subsequent episode. So I quote from the text, I have Monday night to look forward to my first swimming lesson. And when he went to register, the lady asked him, are you from India? She asks, I note, is swimming not encouraged in India? And he said, on the contrary, most Indians swim like fish. I am an exception to the rule. So basically, he was um, not very comfortable with the idea of you know swimming, but then he wanted to learn. And he never learned to swim, although he stayed when he was in India, he stayed very close to the beach, but then he could not learn. And uh, from this narrative, you know, we get to understand that, you know, the narrator has multiple reasons for not learning how to swim. However, finally, he, you know, decides to learn swimming, but then uh, they, that, you know, turns out to be disastrous. As he writes, we are shown how to grasp the rail and paddle face down in the water, 15 feet of water. It is so blue and I can see the bottom. It's too late to back out. Besides, I'm so terrified. I could not find the words to do. So even if I wanted to. So when he really started his swimming lesson, he wanted to you know, back out. And 15 feet of water, you know, that was something that he was really terrified. And he was also uh, and able to understand that, you know, the, the instructor, uh, he does not value the lives of non-white immigrants because he felt that, you know, for simple, so, you know, kind of, you know, shallow uh, levels of swimming training, the instructor cho uh, you know, chose the whites. And then because he was a non-white for 15 feet, you know, it was he who was chosen. Or may maybe the swimming pool is the hangout of some racist group. So here we can clearly see how terrified the narrator was, and this fear is also linked with the fear of an immigrant. And he remembers something very significant when the moment he entered uh, to you know, join the swimming class, there were three white teenager boys. As I and I quote, as I entered the showers, three young boys, probably from a previous class, emerge. One of them holds his nose. The second begins to hum under his breath. Paki, Paki, smell like curry. The third says to the first two, pretty soon all the water is going to taste of curry and then they leave. So this is something that, you know, uh, from our understanding, we can consider it as a kind of discrimination that every immigrant or maybe most of the immigrants have to actually uh, racial discrimination that, you know, they experience. And uh, the thought of the next swimming lesson actually sickens him. And then and this time it was more scary. And finally, uh, he kind of stops going for the swimming lessons after attending two classes. But there is one, you know, kind of ex experience when he was cleaning his bathroom inside the bathtub. He just tried to close his eyes, hold his breath. And then he, you know, all of a sudden gathers all his strength to kind of face it. And maybe this is where, you know, his uh, kind of journey, his self-realization or maybe journey inward began where he knew that he is the only one who can be uh, his best, you know, friend or maybe the best help. And he should himself should be the, uh, you know, his own supporter, you know, they are in, in an, uh, kind of a place, you know, of strangers. He is the only person who can help himself to overcome his own fears. And then he also says that, you know, when successfully he, uh, you know, could stay there in underwater for some time. And he says, I come up, refresh my lungs, examine quickly the overwater world of the washroom and I go in again. I do it several times over and over. Now he has started enjoying this. And he says the world outside the water after I have seen a lot of it, it is now time to see what is inside. And this is the time when he was also writing a book about his own experiences as an immigrant in uh, Canada. So uh, 
next part is the ecological concern to sum up i will very quickly finish it uh, we find a lot of references where it compares you know the sea water near the beach in bombay where for every occasion cultural traditional practices religious practices uh, the water was used and there are some quotes from the text i would quickly read it the sea of chopati was fate and in, uh, to endure the finals of life's everyday functions, it seemed that the dirtier it became, the more crowd it attracted. Too many religious festivals also use the sea as a repository of their finales. We use the sea too to deposit the leftovers from Percy religious ceremonies. He belonged to the Percy community. After Grandpa died, some of his things were flung out to sea. So there is a long narrative how water is kind of considered to be, especially the seawater, uh, becomes a repository for everything. And then the water misery is recurring in my life. He himself writes in his narrative, Chopati Beach, Swimming Pool, Bathtub. So it journey starts, you know, his childhood to his adulthood, from the beach to the swimming pool to the bathtub, where eventually he himself, you know, try to overcome that fear successfully. And I step in and immerse myself up to the neck. It feels good and finally you know he could feel you know it you know that goodness that you know soothing or maybe the healing or maybe the celebratory feeling of overcoming fear fear as an uh, struggling writer uh, fear as an immigrant fear as a struggling writer or fear as a human being in an um, you know uh, uh, in a outside world. So as we see that water becomes an important component in the narrator's life, who was an immigrant author, something that he was so terrified about finally makes him feel healed or suited. So uh, to conclude, a Rohinton mystery effectively shows the difficulty an immigrant faces when making a transition into another urban environment. And in this story, we see how he makes it's a complex and layered narrative where water becomes a static and constant imagery throughout the narrative. And finally, you know, he successfully overcomes uh, his fear of water uh, or aquaphobia. He also proves himself as a successful writer and he was accepted eventually in the community. Uh, thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Sagarikaji. Well, uh, as far as your paper was concerned, well, I really uh, liked how you. How, how you try to make an analogy between between uh, this uh, uh, swimming that the writer is actually scared of, afraid of in uh, Canada. And then, uh, yes, uh, simultaneously, what I could uh, find is that, well, it is also related with how, uh, how an immigrant also tries to find problems in adjustment in a in a foreign land, right? And you also said how he struggled, how he was also simultaneously uh, struggling with uh, writing at that at that point of time, and how later on he became an established writer. Uh, but one particular thing that I really uh, liked or something that uh, we can think of from this perspective of uh, sea literature or aquatic literature it is it is uh, the way he tries to compare uh, these indian rivers actually with what he notices there in uh, canada right so i would just like to uh, know your take on this uh, the way uh, this worship material is actually dumped into the rivers in india and on the other hand we have also got this uh, namami gange sort of drive wherein these these rivers who have some mythological connections are uh, getting the uh, focus of the government but then uh, when it comes to cleaning the water resources right or or rivers right what i think is that all rivers uh, are equally important though we have our belief system uh, which strongly triggers us to uh, yes go to that particular river to wash away our sins or take that holy dip right <laughs> but then uh, how do you how do you contrast it with the i mean uh, rivers as you uh, find in canada or writers take on this particularly okay thank you so much for this question sir uh, actually he has a very detailed kind of description of ganesh chaturthi and then his own Persi community religious uh, festivals coconut festival and then you know the death of his grandfather when uh, they waited uh, literally uh, because they uh, kind of threw most of the stuff in the sea and then they were waiting there and uh, you know, this is a perceived community's belief that if it comes back, then maybe it is not, you know, really going 
to the place where it should ideally go the soul uh, kind of you know uh, a religious kind of you know uh, notion and then they waited and then they saw that everything you know floated well and that it the sea kind of took accepted or maybe you know it, it everything immersed into the sea so uh, from a religious point of view it's kind of like sea is you know taking everything maybe it's, it's you know, taking uh, all the pain away, along with the memories, uh, not, not exactly the memories, but then the material kind of possession of the dead. Uh, he talks about Ganesh Chaturthi, when the clay-made idols are actually, uh, you, know, uh, you know, they just, you know, discard everything into the sea. And then um, he, again, when he talks about uh, water in Canada, especially uh, with reference to the swimming pool, he remembers that it is crystal clear water. And he also says that Chopati Beach, I did not learn swimming because it was too filthy. And uh, the more you know, dirtier it was, the more crowd it attracted, as he mentioned. So the comparison is clear here. Uh, like, uh, thank I mean, you, thank you so much. So it is like, uh, how do I conclude your paper is that let us look at it uh, from an objective perspective, even if you belong to a country which has got so much uh, religious significance of rivers or so, and not yes. from a sentimental perspective, right? So that is exactly. what I uh, conclude from my paper. Thank you. Thank you, Svarkaji. Your paper was really good. Now, uh, over to the last paper presenter here, uh, Dr. Vikas Latter. He's from uh, Haryana and uh, he is going to present his paper on. I don't know about his, about the title of the paper. I request Vikas Latraji to to introduce himself and uh, also talk about his uh, paper and and the title. And then you have got just six to seven minutes, sir. Doctor Vikas Latter. Thank you, uh, Doctor Himraj. Am I audible? Yes, sir. We want you to be visible too. If that is uh, actually, uh, uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for organizing this wonderful uh, work, uh, conference, and uh, it again gave me opportunity to meet my intellectual friend, Dr. Hemraj, again, and uh, on the, this virtual space only, and in this new normal world where time and space boundaries have collapsed, and it's always a pleasure to share my ideas. Uh, with a wonderful uh, philosopher and wonderful professor like you. So my topic is uh, role of water in English literature. And uh, this is a very general topic. And my focus of the paper is that I want to, because my earlier speakers have uh, uh, spoken a lot about the various aspects of uh, within water and literature, like the about the ecological perspective, they have talked about the capitalist perspective, and they have talked uh, related with the life also. Now, my, I will focus why uh, the water uh, has captured the imagination of writers, why our literary persons uh, are so much, uh, uh, why they like to present water in their uh, works. Now, uh, first of all, I want to start, as you know, that water is an essential and vital element of our life. Uh, without it, uh, we acknowledge that our survival is not possible. Actually, it is the basis of life. Now, uh, I want to conceptualize the water in multiple perspective. First of all, if we like look at from the scientific perspective, as you know, that water is a uh, compound and it's made from H2O. Uh, it's a formula. It's a hydrogen oxygen combined. And uh, our geographically, if we see on the earth around even I our mean, human body is uh, it can it contains 70 percent water so uh, so this is an important part uh, scientifically uh, even social da darwin has said that our life started uh, from the aquatic ecosystem only especially human being uh, we have evolved from the aquatic system so there is no doubt if we uh, look at from the anthropology anthropological or historical perspective uh, you can see that there is a very close relationship between water and humanity. And uh, uh, I was teaching my students today uh, one essay by uh, Stephen Hawkins uh, that's choosing our universe. When there is a one reference, there is there is a central uh, African tribe, Bosungo, and uh, they people believe 
that uh, in when the universe started there was only water and darkness and the lord uh, bumba he vomited and created the universe he created he, actually he created the sun so according to them and many mythologies water existed even before human beings there is no doubt so water is is, is a, a basic element of our survival over humanity now uh, as we are aware on on civilization basis also that the uh, most productive or our civilization grew near water resources especially near rivers our ganges rivers or nile river civilization you can see the the water uh, was the, uh, the it it led to the settlement of agriculture it led to the settlement of society which ultimately uh, developed if we see from historian perspective also like there is a colonization and the europeans uh, they colonized the world and the water was the main a uh, way for this like columbus started uh, the search for new uh, world in 1492 then vasco da gama he uh, discovered india through water only through sea route only and uh, then uh, in the 16th century during the elizabethan era uh, the like uh, the captured uh, the defeat of spanish armada that led to the glorification of uh, uh, glorification of english culture and that uh, infused the pride in english people and which is reflected in elizabethan literature so uh, if we look at from the whole perspective that we can see that europe uh, has especially european literature or english literature has especially been uh, influenced by this water thing if we look at from cultural perspective as you know that water is not simply a uh, it says not a simple compound actually uh, b- due to its importance it has been grained you know in ingrained in our culture also it is a symbol of divinity it is symbol of religion and you know in every culture take example of india we have indra god we have varun god and even Uh, there is uh, in western culture also there are so many sea gods river gods okay we have mother ganga there as uh, you were mentioning in that lecture that there namami ganges uh, ganges project is going on and we are treating uh, ganga as our mother so this is this is a part of our culture also it is part of our festivals also like if you see our festivals are there related to monsoon and they are related to water because water is directly related to productivity through agriculture and so many uh, if we take a ecological perspective as ma'am has said coca cola case and the earlier speaker also that we are now uh, concerned about the uh, issues of water pollution there are many pesticides or many waste we are throwing in the water so literature has also uh, been concerned about this so due to all these regions the it has captured the imagination of europe or especially english literature uh, english writers in my paper i will briefly uh, tackle uh, the three classic works because, because i know i hope everyone is familiar with them uh, one is uh, 18th century novel uh, daniel defoe's robinson crusoe another one is joseph conrad's classic heart of darkness and third one is uh, gm singh's classic the riders to the sea i hope everyone is uh, aware about the stories but i want to uh, put my perspective about the relation of uh, the role of water in this uh, in these works if you take the daniel defoe's robinson crusoe as you know that uh, the young robinson he wants to uh, enter as a sea boys to because it was for that generation it was a medium to earn money and it was a medium for entertainment Continue. although okay okay although she tries to uh, warn him she actually then she test him actually and it provides a medium of immaturity a medium of maturity and ultimately uh, due to the sea storm he is landed into an isolated island and he learns the life lessons and he learned that uh, how to live with the nature and how to, important is the basic elements of life then uh, you know this heart of darkness it reflects the colonial expeditions of europeans and there is a uh, there is a ref- reference to congo river and congo river uh, becomes the medium of exploitation 
and it also uh, becomes a medium of self realization of uh, marlow and kurt especially marlow he learns the paradoxical statements of europeans who say that uh, it's a white man birds and civilized the africans but okay it exposes uh, through the river congo actually exposes the agenda of colonization then third one is right to the sea it's a very classical and moving play as you know where it's a very ironical and paradoxical situation where the sea provides the food to the people sea is the mean of survival and but moria the main character she loses she loses six her six sons in the sea only so we can say that there is a sea we, live, we people go to to the sea to die so it's a very par- uh, paradoxical situation so uh, i mean to say there are so many other works like hira ben shod's famous uh, uh, poem woman where uh, the he she compares man with sea and uh, river woman with river and she questions the gender concepts that why sea always why river has to merge into sea only why sea has to lose her identity only and there is a famous dover beach poem as you know so into i want to conclude that because uh, literature is a cultural product it's a cultural expression and water is an essential element of our culture that is why it is always present through literature and it will always keep on capturing the imagination creativity of the future generation also thank you so much Uh, thank you thank you thank so you, much dr dr vikas latharji well uh, there was a lot actually that you brought in you looked at uh, that is as to how water can be looked at from various perspectives right water as divinity water how uh, what kind of importance does it have in our culture right how it is uh, seen in the form of gods right in india and then in 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 greek uh, mythology for that matter or latin mythology for that matter right and uh, you also try to focus on how this whole process of colonization it took place through 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 sea only because we know that the trade earlier it was conducted only through sea route because we did not have access to airlines which came in the 20th century so well we are aware with that we are aware with vasco da gama's coming to india that is in uh, in in calicut in 1498 and then vasco da gama discovering america in 1492 right and we also know how that entire african slave trade something that we call nowadays as african slavery it came through those those that atlantic ocean right called as the transatlantic slavery right so how actually this 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 these seas have actually been uh, used for for you know for advancing the the, the advancing this uh, empirical right not empirical but then a colonial uh, expansion over uh, over over the years right and then into many uh, countries so we uh, you try to look at that too and at the end of the discussion you brought in this uh, three uh, actually novels right and try to uh, there was one two novels and one a play actually and then you try to look at how uh, the rivers or or water has been used in these three a particular texts differently so uh, thank you thank you bikasti i do not have any question to uh, put to you to post to thank you thank you so much uh, thank you so much i i do hope everyone enjoyed uh, your paper too so uh, thank you uh, organizers thank you cape comoran trust for this uh, entire session uh, over to ashisha and savior With that, we have come to the end of final session of paper presentations. Thank you so much, Mr. Hemraj, for your valuable presence. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. We appreciate your hard work and wish you a great future ahead. I would like to extend my sincere gratitude to Dr. Regin Silvest, President Cape Comoran, and Dr. Sister Manju Jacob and other teachers from Pike College. I would also like to thank other professors and research scholars from other colleges thank you one and all